Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to this Intra Logistics Connected webinar. I'm Christopher Walton, Editor of Logistics Manager, and I'm your host for this interactive session where Locus Robotics and Boots UK will discuss their experience implementing warehouse automation. In this webinar, we'll learn how robots help Boots increase productivity, handle unexpected volume spikes, and make them stronger and better prepared than ever before. You'll also hear how Boots UK evaluates, chooses, and implements automation into its own organization. Uses robots to double, uses robots to double pick lines picked per hour, easy for me to say, and increase accuracy to meet rapid delivery expectations. Scales to meet periods of high and or unexpected demand without additional labor, and improves safety and reduces workplace accidents by 77% despite increased volumes. To ensure that we got both Boots UK and Locus Robotics on our webinar today, uh, our webinar has been partially pre-recorded. So coming up, you'll see Karen Levitt, Chief Marketing Officer at Locus Robotics, and Adam Coventry, Head of Warehousing for Boots.com at Boots UK in discussion as they talk about how both parties successfully meet the growth of online purchases and seasonal spikes, while providing customers with quality service and timely deliveries. Following the pre-recorded section, we'll be joined by Karen, uh, who will be for the interactive part of the webinar, and she will field all of your questions when it comes to warehouse automation. So don't be shy. Ask your questions throughout this webinar as soon as they cross your mind. I'll be able to see them in the Q&A box that's on the bottom of your screen uh, and I'll pose them to Karen at the end of the webinar. Uh, when asking questions we would also urge you to leave your name. Uh, it's much better than having a question asked anonymously uh, and we'd love to know who you are out there. Uh, so without further ado this webinar will begin. Hello, thank you for joining us today. My name is Karen Levitt. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer at Locus Robotics. And joining me today is Adam Coventry, who is the Head of Warehousing for Boots.com in the UK. Adam, thanks so much for joining me today. Karen, it's, uh, it's very kind of you to invite me along and uh, yeah, very, very much looking forward to our discussion. Thanks, so am I. I am really excited about what Boots is doing with your warehouse automation, and I think it was really exciting before, but now in the era of the pandemic where you've been responding so quickly to the changes in the marketplace, it's, it's been even more exciting to watch. Yeah, abs absolutely, Karen. Um, it's been quite a phenomenal uh, uh, last six months, um, but a but a but a very exciting uh, eighteen months really, uh, particularly from when we started uh, working with yourselves at uh, Locus Robotics. Um, so yeah, so it's been it's been quite a journey, and uh, I suppose hopefully we'll be able to uh, talk you through through some of the uh, elements of that journey. I would love for you to share that. Uh, so let's uh, let's see where where did this all get started you had a pretty heavily automated warehouse before we ever before we ever met yeah abs absolutely um yeah so we've seen we've seen a lot of changes uh big big change in demand i think uh particularly uh on our online operations uh in the united kingdom um and yeah it's 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 quite quite ne neatly summarized we've seen our, our customer dynamics changing and really how they want to buy products is massively changed and particularly the speed of that change uh we were beginning to see it last year but it's been huge huge the uh the, the rate of change over the last six months particularly great well and when we first met obviously it was pre-pandemic and you were really you were seeing tremendous demand and and change within boots.com to begin with and that's how you started the journey really working to automate your, your to add additional automation to your facility before anybody knew about covid uh, maybe you could share with us sort of short sort of a little bit of background on boots and 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 how 
how that that uh, that the whole journey evolved. Absolutely, Karen. It seems a you know a sensible place to start, and and it's good to understand sort of uh, Boots as a business because it, it puts some context about uh, how the how the supply chain has evolved. Um, so Boots is is very much the the largest uh, uh, health and beauty um, pharmacy led retailer uh, in the United Kingdom, and. Uh, as you probably know, it's part of the Walgreens Boots Alliance. So it's part of a company um, that, that, that is mainly really based and operates in the US, but um, the UK operations are significant. Um, a very large high street presence. It's quite a, a unique retailer from that perspective. Um, so a lot of our customers are very close to our, our shops in the UK. Um, that's been the core of what we've done for a good 170 years. Um, but I still think it's going to be very relevant as we move into this new world as people try and find this balance or we try and find the balance for what our customers want to do between online retailing um, and, and shopping in our shops. So we're definitely exploring and it's right at the front of what we do, this transition to a, into an a omni-channel uh, retailer. Um, so yeah, so that's a little bit about the Boots um, setup as it currently stands at the moment. Um, from, a, from a supply chain perspective, we interesting we've had a culture that's been particularly interested in trying to optimize through efficiency and from a service perspective as much as possible particularly using uh, automation and we've put most of our operations our main operations have significant amounts of uh, quite sophisticated automation uh, in them at the moment you know that it's certainly a culture we have and it very much has directed how we progress and certainly what we've done over the last 18 months um, so just building a little bit on the on the sort of business dynamics we have from a, from an online perspective um, over the last few years we've very much seen a two sides to our online operation uh, we see a sort of reasonably steady off peak period um, but we but we really notice a big change as we go into that sort of Christmas season usually headlined by the arrival of Black Friday so we we have to thank you guys for that um, but it's, it, you know, and that brings a massive change to demand on our dot-com operations in a very short period of time. And as you will all know, from a supply chain perspective, it, it really stresses your infrastructure uh, and it puts your solutions and it really tests uh, how you've designed your supply chain. Um, so that's, that's very much the um, sort of predicament we have traditionally over the last few years for our, our um, online operations. Um, I'll probably just add one last point actually, but our, our um, strategy on um, the, the automation is very much to invest to a point that we can uh, maximize its utilization. It uh, really means um, running our, uh, our um, automated facility, particularly for the off-peak period, and therefore we use different solutions, often quite manual but more temporary solutions to deal with the sort of seasonal spikes but with the underlying growth not line we are, with online we are definitely beginning to get to the capacity of the um, the base automation that we have in our operations at the moment so that was that was the underlying driving force uh, behind looking at that and saying it's really not just about dealing with the peaks of Black Friday, but all year long, how do you make sure your automation is supporting that and then also deal with those, those spikes? Yeah, abs abs absolutely. And, um, you know, probably if I um, transition a little bit further into our dot-com operations um, to give you to, to explore that a bit further. Um, we actually made a, good, a very good decision about 10 years ago or so. We bought a very large site in the middle of the United Kingdom. Um, it's, it's near a, a sort of regional town, which is well known for its production of beer. It's called Burton-on-Trent. And we have a very large site there. It's about 400,000 square foot. Uh, the attraction of that location, it's, it's absolutely in the middle of the United Kingdom and it maximizes the ability to both to get to the, uh, the, the, the south coast and well into the middle of Scotland uh, on a very um, on the most efficient transport infrastructure, so it's a very it's a very good location within that site. As I mentioned, we invested quite heavily very early on in an automation solution for, um, and as I said, we're getting towards the uh, towards the capacity of that at the moment. 
but that was not able to cope with and has not been able to cope with the the seasonal spikes that we or the seasonal pattern that we have um, and we have a very significant area in the middle of that building uh, which is dedicated very much to a sort of traditional warehouse pick beat um, so that would be uh, colleagues pushing manual very large trolleys around um, quite a slow production rate often you know it's uh, quite a congested area so and as that area was increasing in demand um, a couple of years ago I was asking us some quite significant questions about how can we um, take this forward at the level of uh, demand or increase that we're seeing in our um, dot com operations interesting so yeah i mean it's a it's an impressive diagram and and there is it's it's look there's a juicy heart right there with just you know the seven thousand square meters sitting there waiting waiting for opportunity to to strike there so so what was uh what was your thinking about that you know in the end it was a little bit of a no-brainer um we actually we absolutely had to make that transition into robotics we needed to have that um seasonal requirement um and our strategy was that it didn't lend itself to major automation investment we needed a different solution uh, and that's how we've come to this um robotic solution that we, we we're going to talk you through i think you know obviously Anybody starting out on a project like this really has to lay the groundwork by saying, what are we trying to accomplish and, and what are our requirements? How did you put these elements together? What were the key decision factors in, in driving this particular deployment? Yeah, yeah, Karen, it's, it's a really, really good question. And, um, and, and, and these were the questions we were asking ourselves a couple of years ago. Um, we could see a series of challenges in front of us. Um, very clearly was the first context of labor. Um, so by being located in the middle of the UK, it's, it was beginning to, and is very much becoming a very attractive place for, um, online retailers to base themselves. So there is a lot of competition for a, a limited labor market. Um, and within that the seasonal late nature of uh, attracting labor was very demanding so you'd often have a, 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 a quite a secure base for your off-peak period say 30 weeks of the year and then you would be competing significantly to recruit uh, a, a, a very large number of colleagues so we typically ran our base operation at about 500 colleagues uh, we would be looking to recruit another 2,000 colleagues for us to um, deal with the throughput levels that we're expecting to. Um, and that's quite a transient workforce, often uh, by, the, by, their, by their nature of the seasonality that they operate in. They may come for a period of time uh, and, you know, a few weeks later they may depart for another role. And that puts all sorts of demands on your able ability to train, um, the ability to optimize uh, really increased performance. So it's a very, very ch challenging business model uh, that we were operating at that, at that time. But the beer helps, right? <laughs> it might have helped them. <laughs> On the other hand, speed and accuracy might be, <laughs> might be a little bit put off by that. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, um, yeah, the brewery was actually literally over the road, actually. So it wasn't far away. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, no, it's 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 interesting, isn't it? So um, the expectations of online trading are changing so quickly. Um, I've got to be careful what I say about uh, one of our competitors, but um, you know, Am Amazon are such a big player on the online market that they can really very quickly influence the expect customers' expectations. Often about the speed of delivery. Um, so you know, all the time that is changing our infrastructure to be able to, you know, in a way, keep up. But actually, in a way, I think Boots has the opportunity, hopefully in the not too distant, to actually improve it significantly. And that fundamentally hangs off our 2,400 2, shops. Amazon do not that have that. A lot of other companies do not have that uh, presence. When we really organize ourselves, which we're on a journey to, 
uh, I think we'll be able to offer a lot of different service propositions potentially much quicker than what you're seeing at the moment. So, yeah, so we're in a we're in a sort of state of just keeping up with what the competition's going at, but I don't think it'll be that long before we have some real opportunities to to make a step in front. I remember even from my first visit to the UK as a teenager, you know, in every corner there's a Boots the Chemist. Um, and as you say, that, that, that is... Uh, it, it really it blankets the the landscape uh, yeah, everywhere you go in the yeah. UK. Yeah, and I, uh, you know, I, it's, you know, the retail landscape is changing, um, and just you know, certainly recently, um, you know, with with customers moving even more into online, it it certainly puts the uh, challenges of your estate, your 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 how you design your shop infrastructure significantly. But I, I genuinely believe, I think, I think Boots as a, a company, as a culture, sees that importance of having that physical presence. And I, I think we, if, we can, if we can navigate our route, way through this short-term period, I, I think we'll be able to realize some significant benefits that we may have not even you know, got our heads around at the moment um, by keeping that physical infrastructure. I really enjoyed seeing the last time I was there, the really tight integration between the brick and mortar store and the online experience because the the colleagues in the store are actually able to assist consumers who walk into the shops with placing an online order and then the customer can go and pick up that merchandise back in the shop and the shops are are getting credit for that sale so it really yeah. incentivizes the associates in the store to assist with online, you're, you really integrated the online operation. So it's not competing with the brick and mortar operation. Yeah. Yeah. No, you touched on two really interesting points there. I mean, before, um, be before the last six months, um, okay. <laughs> I, 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 the, the, the norm was for most of our customers who used our online services to pick their orders up from the shop. So it's called click and collect. Um, mm -hmm. We were able, because we were able to integrate that with our supply chain infrastructure that was in existence for replenishing our shops, it was a very, very efficient way of getting orders to our customers through the shops. Uh, and of course, you can then offer it as free as, as, as a free uh, service. So the next day proposition, people were ordering quite late into the evening beyond 8 p.m. Um, and the ability for us to get it there that evening and it was in the shop before uh, perhaps the lunchtime period, very attractive to our yeah. customers. Um, so that, that was our core sort of proposition. The other, the other point you mentioned is was, was really beginning to engage the shops in, in, um, in our online operations. Um, the journey, you know, if I go back a few years, is quite difficult in some respects because the shops are really engaged. They're all about serving customers directly. Um, and perhaps it was a little bit of a distraction to run, um, you know, managing this, these orders from somewhere else. I, it, it is really changing and it is changing very quick now. I think our, our store colleagues are, are really understanding. In some cases, we actually have the ability to complete orders in shops so they can actually do some of the pick and pack okay. operation in shops. So it just shows that we're really beginning to combine the two elements of retailing together quite effectively, I think. So talk about what this has, you know, how your cost structure, what, what were the needs there that you were trying to tackle? Yeah, it's the basic principles of running a supply chain, isn't it? You're continually trying to balance the, the, the cost um, against the service proposition that you aspire for. Um, you know, having, having operated in the industry, it's, it's second nature. So as soon as you get an opportunity to, to make some headway into one of those, uh, you, you take it with open arms and definitely the, you know, the robotic solutions we're seeing um, uh, for multiple reasons. Um, you know, as I was describing, we had quite a traditional um, pick operation. It was labor intensive and quite low product production rates. Very quickly, very simplistically, the the the, the robot solutions that we we've employed of um, you know have have have, have, have improved those, those elements, and with that uh, comes uh, financial revenue savings, and also the attraction of of what what we're thinking of is the is the entrance cost, isn't it? It's that capital investment. 
and again where you can find solutions which is quite low in that area again it ticks a lot of boxes and um, I think those are the two things that we're particularly looking at and then of course making sure that you're preparing for the future always yeah yeah and, and, and don't, don't we know it after the last uh, six months so um, you know it's pretty demanding just to deal with a you know, a sales profile, a demand profile that we were reasonably confident in. Um, we knew that Christmas was coming <laughs> and we knew there would be a significant demand. So you could, in some degree, estimate what was going to happen. Um, but even with that knowledge, it was very, very demanding putting the infrastructure in um, to, to deal with it. And, you know, the, the, the solutions that you're really looking for are something that A, a deals with that, but gives you the flexibility to deal with the unknowns, for example, the last six months. Yeah, well, dealing with the unknown is, is pretty critical. So, um, so as you started to explore all of these different, different criteria, how did, how did the Locus solution fit what you were, what you were looking for there? Because we were looking at a solution to our seasonal profile, which is a relatively small period of the year. We were, we're looking for specific, you know, requirements that we're just describing. And that's what we were beginning to see with Locus. I mean, it's described here as a simple solution. I can absolutely validate that. Um, you know, the ability to, uh, at, at pace, begin to integrate it into our systems. And, you know, for lots of other reasons that we'll touch upon, it, it was very helpful. I mean, at that point, there weren't actually that many other companies. I, you know, we were one of the first companies that we, we worked with. And I think to confirm our decision by the fact that Locus is now operating in well over 50 companies in, in such a short period of time just sort of uh, vindicates the decision uh, that we made. Well, thank you. If the last six months have taught us nothing, it's that flexibility is, is absolutely critical in, in all that we do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, Karen. Um, you know, and this is the, the 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 beauty of the solution because you know they're because it's autonomous robotic units you're buying in, and the way that the uh, solution is constructed, you can literally work with yourselves to secure more of those units at very you know very quickly. Um, and, and that's what we have needed at times. And we've had multiple experiences where you've been able to help us very, very quickly, unexpectedly secure more robotic units that we can then have running in our operation very quickly. So we can, we can actually can confirm that um, requirement for yeah, flexibility. Obviously, we, we do work with you to try and plan for capacity and needs that are expected, but the unexpected has has cropped up more than we expected it would in the last uh, in the last year so i think um you know being able to have that flexibility and what we've discovered in this and i know you're going to share with us your experiences around covid in a few minutes but one of the things that um i found really heartwarming maybe is the right word is when when covid did hit and it was it was just after peak, and your business really got slammed with with Black Friday sized volumes every day because because you you're dealing with essential products. And we had another customer a couple hundred miles from you who had just come off their peak, and they had yeah. robots that they were going to be returning, and they they put some on a truck and and got them to your dock so that you could immediately add extra robots to your fleet. So I. I found that sense of community really heartwarming. You, you were bringing them in uh, at the beginning of this year from all around the globe. I think you flew some in from the US, you shipped some over from we Europe. We did. And as you said, a couple of the, your other customers in the UK were able to help as well. So it was a yeah, joint effort, <laughs> much appreciated. It, which is great. So yeah, and I think we've worked hard to make sure that that the deployment is really lightweight and, and more important that that flexibility, as you said, to scale up or scale down because more and more these days, we know less about what the future is going to bring. We, mm. uh, you know, we all try in our businesses to have the analytics and the, and the sense of history to, to drive our decision-making, but the world 
can change very quickly as we're discovering. Yeah, yeah, uh, and it's def- definitely, and the, um, you know, it's that concept, as you say, that we, we, we could have, um, you know, a, cu- a couple hundred of the cobots on site, and for demand on a particular day, we could use 150 of them the following day, uh, something happens in the commercial plan or, you know, um, there's a bit of PR somewhere that customers are interested in a particular product. We may need to operate 180 or 190 the following day. Um, and that, you know, that ability is, is absolutely critical to, to operating these sort of businesses at the moment. Definitely. So that's good. And I know you, you folks really have a strong commitment to your colleagues, to the associates, making sure mm. that the, that the work experience is positive, not just because it's good business, but I think because it's, it's really your commitment to your workforce. Um, so, you know, one of the things that we've always tried to incorporate into the locus design is that worker friendliness is, yeah. is the notion that we're making not just the workers more productive, but making their experience more attractive. Um, you know, when they, when they go home at the end of the day, we want them to feel that, that they've, they've just had a very satisfying work experience. I know yeah. in, in yeah. our early conversations, that was the case, that discussion yeah. around that. Yeah, yeah, it's the core, you know, it's great doing all the sort of technical designs, understanding the concepts that you want, but, uh, you know, absolutely fundamental requirement of any new solution is that um, how, how it integrates, interacts with the colleagues who will be using it. Um, so a key requirement and very quickly and very easily you could see um, the, the simplicity, um, the intuitive nature of the uh, of of the solution with the with the robots, with the interfaces, with the you know the the, the screen, um, you know how simple it was to operate. So a, a very key requirement, and we saw the benefits of that or the potential of it with the um, with, with with the Locus Cobot solution, definitely. Yeah, that's good. So um, so what did you were your were the results what you were expecting? Yeah, it's absolutely amazing, really. Um, so I, I think given the speed of the whole project and the fact that we were implementing it, you know, just last year before our peak trading period, which is a hugely challenging and, you know, risky period to be putting a change project in. Yeah, it was um, Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, you know, it's, you know, any, any startup is difficult, but we were talking hours on this project, you know, when we were, weren't hitting output levels by the hour, we were... You know, as, as we'll explain in a bit, you know, the, how we solved some of those problems. Um, so when I stand back and look at the fact that we were probably definitely hitting, you know, uh, a doubling of the improvement in our production rates, you know, within a, within a, a few weeks, uh, absolutely amazing. You know, those are expectations. That's how we resourced up. So we had to do it because we'd only asked for that number of amount of labor to come in through that peak period of time. So there was quite a lot of pressure, but we absolutely got there. But what's been really encouraging is as you've, as we've been able to spend a bit more time um, in the subsequent months, you know, the, the, the work that has been done to really optimize the design and improve it, you know, we're, we're easily seeing uh, increased productivity rates, which is a key requirement that we were expecting, but it's, it's definitely been delivering. So it was very, very, very good from that perspective. Yeah, I think that's really key to understand. It's really not a matter of dropping off the technology and, you know, see ya. It's that whole continuous improvement process. You do that all the time. That's just your normal, mm-hmm. your normal ethos within, within the Boots organization. And I think at, at all of our customer sites, this notion that we're not going to stop with our next innovation, but we have to keep figuring out that that, that will give us a, a, a foundation to innovate even further. Uh, so, you, you know, the, the implementation of any d- technology is really just a starting point to see where it goes from there. Yeah, as you say, it is, uh, it's very much a culture, probably within Boots, but definitely within Boots' supply chain. Um, and, you know, it's just been pretty phenomenal, really, the investments that we've continued in the, in the first part of this year, um, which are already been designed and implemented as we approach this next peak season. So, you know, it gives me a lot of confidence in, in, in what we'll be able to achieve over the next few months, definitely. Well, that's terrific. So, and I know that worker safety has, mm. has been a factor that's been affected and, 
yeah. and just that's a really, really good story on this one yeah really good story on this one because i think when you if you haven't worked with the concept concept of a, an autonomous robot or a cobot um your first experience of it is it is uh you you're pretty you know you it feels a bit you know unnatural um so when we were beginning to commission the project what we the big question we had would be how how would our colleagues interact with them and what confidence levels would they had and what locus were saying was it real um but wow uh when you look back at it now not not only was it the speed that people got used to operating with them um but a huge unexpected benefit is it totally trans changed the that whole um particular area of the operation um wow as, it, as i was describing before it was you know it was a very traditional pick operation and the only way you could get more out of it was put more people in it and as you put more people in a constrained space you definitely got a not particularly good environment to work in it was too busy too congested trolleys would be bumping people uh creating accidents and it the introduction of the cobots massively de-stressed um that whole environment and totally changed it for the better and and you know unexpectedly we we saw a not not just a small reduction in accidents, a massive reduction of, of accidents, you know, to the tune of well over seventy percent great in that area, which was, you know, which was which was brilliant. That's terrific. And that of course just creates a again a better experience for the for the colleagues to want to continue there, which probably reduces the stress when you're trying to recruit labor down the road. Absolutely. Absolutely. For lots, you know, for lots of reasons, you know, the uh, colleagues have a lot of choice in that where where we're based um you know there's a lot of mm -hmm. big competitors very close to us um and you've got to believe that you know if if you begin to create a culture that has all the basics in place but is actually quite an interesting and uh, an enjoyable place to work and we have seen that so we have seen our absence levels get better we've seen our attrition levels reduce and they, you know when you re require you know a lot of support those are really important metrics from from the, from a people perspective so um you know as you think about some of the the other benefits you know obviously measuring the quantitative things like doubling productivity or reducing reducing injuries and so forth is important but what other benefits did you did you see by putting the automation in place the, yeah, yeah, it's it's probably building on it a bit further. Actually, it was the you know as I was describing, you know, the, the, the environment changed, um, and and we, and it was used actually in the end um, as a real uh, physical demonstration of where the company needed to go, where our senior management wanted the company to go. We needed to innovate. We needed to use technology, and it was a very uh, tangible demonstration of that direction that we wanted to go people could come and see what the future might look like um, and so it was used certainly you know by our senior management teams across the company as an example of um, you know the sort of direction that the, that the company and it, and it is still used uh, as that so you know those are some of the other um, uh, other spin-offs that come off I think I also reflect on that when we were just talking about the CI the continuous improvement approach I you know that got us through the early parts of the implementation implementing big change in your peak period you wouldn't usually do it and we did take a risk <laughs> but it was because of that approach that as the problem occurred the joint team would find a solution and you know personally I I got confidence that that would happen very quickly and therefore we you know we made the decision to, to, to absolutely make sure we delivered it it was about this time of year I think when yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. When we well, it, was, it. it was it was, it was even Some tougher people might that, say that's actually. kind of crazy yeah uh, yeah yeah well it was the big interesting because we were it was the first time there that we were operating or you were operating the cobots in Europe so we were waiting, right. we were waiting for some of the quality uh, assurances. So you know we had that we had sort of the base set up running in test, um, but actually to make that transition into you know fully operational cobots, we had to wait until we got the quality test completed, which took us very close to the start of the, um, yeah, we, the peak trading period. We got yep. that CE certification. So, right. but it's but it's worked out. Um, Absolutely. So, Absolutely. and all Absolutely. of that took place 
in the before times when the world was normal. So Ben. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> ben, ben COVID hit. So you had all of these challenges before of, of labor, of, of um, employee relations, of safety, and, um, and of course, productivity that you were, that you were striving for. Um, those things didn't go away. And then COVID-19 came along mm. and it mm. added new challenges on top of it. So what did, what did you see there? So the first thing with um, the, the COVID period, it was, you know, it's just totally unknown and unexpected. So you have zero plans in place, you know, for a peak period, but probably spending most of the nine months of the year designing and planning for it. So this literally occurred with a little bit of insight, you know, a few weeks, you could see what was happening around the world, but actually trying to interpret that, what that meant for, you know, your own particular country and your own particular economy, you know, no, no one could have predicted that. Um, and, and, and we saw, you know, very quickly two, two things happen. We saw a, um, a period of intense panic buying through our shop operations. Um, and then literally as you know, most countries moved into that lockdown phase, uh, all trading, a huge amount of trading had to happen online. Uh, and therefore you, we saw a, a massive, massive increase in the demand of our online, um, op operations. Um, so as I said, yes, yeah, so, we, you know, wh whether, so that was interpreting the lockdown, um, trying to anticipate the labor availability and that situation was incredibly difficult. Um, so, you know, we did, we, we were assuming that all companies would be absorbing all labor and it would be almost impossible to get hold of people. Um, so yes, huge, huge set of dynamics. And of course we were then, as we learned very quickly, the safety of your colleagues is absolutely paramount. So you then had to put absolutely. safety systems in place very quickly. You know, you couldn't have asked for a more significant set of challenges or actually, you know, a really good test of, of, of the capability of your, of your supply chain. Absolutely. I mean, obviously the supply chain became more than ever before a lifeline for consumers who were who were locked down, um, sometimes the only people they saw during the day were the delivery people mm. bringing goods to their to their homes. Uh, and then, of course, within your environment, you had to worry about well, within all you know, within all workplace environments, the worker safety. So we had devised our solution design uh, to provide the greatest productivity. And you really helped us understand how, how much our design point helped with worker safety, that because we naturally sort of keep the workers separated from one another, we're able to use locus to, to enforce social distancing measures in the warehouse. And I think you did that very effectively. Yeah, absolutely. We, we would not have been able to uh, operate, deliver, anywhere near the output levels we did um, if we'd had the um, previous pick solution in place for lots sure. of reasons but one of them was the safety of the colleagues it, that that old solution had too many people in a confined area and we would have to de-stress that area and therefore reduce the headcount and therefore reduce the output so it's, it's as simple as that, the, the COVID operation, because yeah. of the increase in productivity, because the, the way colleagues, uh, you know, interact with the, with the cobots, you know, we could massively increase the output from that area and, and actually look after the colleagues, make them safer. So, you know, it was, it's great. I'd, I'd like to think it was all thought through, but by God, we were incredibly lucky from that perspective. That was good. Yeah, we, we planned it that way. We planned for a, for a global pandemic. <laughs> no, we, we didn't do that. But uh, so, no, it, it's, it's interesting to see how the volumes year over year, yeah. uh, you know, from, from 2019 to 2020, went in terms of of orders both both uh you know orders and and lines uh jumped up seeing that that seasonal peak there the natural seasonal peak there at the end of 2019 um makes you know that, yeah, that's what we all definitely. expect to see right yeah yeah uh, so i to, to two things so we actually saw um orders increase so that's the you know the bottom two lines 
Um, but what was really interesting was the way customers were ordering. Um, so, and quite logically, they wanted to um, decrease the number of interactions they had to pick up points. And also actually it was because there was so much demand online, I think the feeling was, I wanna make sure I get my stuff. So we saw more importantly from an automation perspective, a, a significant increase in the number of items that people are ordering every time they placed an order. Uh, and that was the real thing that placed the pressure on the uh, infrastructure or, or, of our supply chain. So it's a huge step change and we call them order lines. It was a, it was a massive step change. And, and we were operating well above the um, capacity that we designed for our previous peak Friday, peak period. Um, and remember that was set up with many, many months worth of planning um, for a specific period of time. This, this went up unexpectedly and has stayed at that level for you know, three or four months now. So you know, huge, huge challenge, um, but, but we had to deal with it. Absolutely. I mean, really the world has, has changed so dramatically uh, and you know, coronavirus has, has brought change to, every, to all walks of life. But when you're running a mission critical and essential service business that's really keeping people's lives going, then mm. there's there's no margin for error. Yeah, yeah, you, that's really true. Yeah, so it's, it's because of because of the each uh, all of our shops have a pharmacy in it. Um, so quite obviously they were classed as an essential uh, business, and they had a requirement that they had to operate. Um, that all sounds good actually, but be, but 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 hot, but maintaining our pharmacies open. Um, during a lockdown period where actually we were restricting the ability for people to get to our shops, put some serious pressures on the business. So we were sort of required to operate at full capacity, um, but actually, you know, the footfall and the revenue streamed into our shops had, you know, de decreased massively. So that it put some real pressure on the, um, the fundamentals of, of, of the business, you know. Yeah. And you know, just the, the, your nature as an essential, as an essential retailer, uh, while continuing to maintain your relationship with your customers, obviously the, you know, this is, this is when the customers really come to count on, on the, the lifelong relationship they've had with Boots through the years mm. and, and making sure you're delivering the brand promise to your customers throughout. Absolutely. Is, yeah. Is essential. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the expectations are really high. So obviously with that drop in on, as we've described, with people going to our shops, the transition into that massive step change online and with the inventory we have, the healthcare, the pharmacy-based inventory, as you say, it's not just the expectations are high, it's almost the necessity for uh, those medicines in some cases to, to be able to get Absolutely. to our customers. So it puts huge pressure on the supply chain. And, and you know, it, go, it goes back to we needed to have the infrastructure in place to, to enable us to, to, to be able to flex up to, um, to, 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 to deliver that. And, you know, um, um, and for all the reasons we've described and all the examples, we were able to do it. So, you know, we were able to source more infrastructure, expand our footprint, integrate more into our Wi-Fi networks very quickly. Uh, and it definitely facilitated us being able to keep up with the demand that was being placed. Um, That's good. Well, I have to operations. tell you, it's been a tremendous source of pride for us at, at Locus to be able to support a brand as revered as as boots and boots.com and uh and it's as you said it's been a real learning experience for all of us throughout you were our first site off you know outside north america and now we've we've added others of course but um but but that experience has has been essential i'll, I'll say that the fact that you've long had this commitment to automation and technology and that vision really helped inform our thinking about how we delivered the product to you. And, and um, it, it's really been a collaborative effort mm. throughout. Yeah, it's, a, it's a, my reflection a little bit is quite interesting. It's, it's quite unusual for, um, you know, quite large traditional companies, certainly in Boots history to, you know, the, typically you'd make a decision to partner someone who probably had the same sort of credentials. They've probably had a lot of history, a lot of, you know, credibility, you know, they're, they're well-known brands typically. So 
you know, it's, it's, it, it's a really good example of perhaps within the supply chain within Boots um, and, you know, those early interactions must have convinced both companies or certainly us that we you know, were prepared to take a risk because there wasn't, you know, it would, as you just described, there were relatively few sites. So, you know, to be able to pick up the concept and have confidence in such a new technology so quickly, um, you know, you'd definitely argue it was a bit of a risk from, from our perspective. Um, but as we've said, it's, it's, you know, it's absolutely paid off. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, and as you mentioned, the, the cultural impact, it's, that's, that's something that's really gratifying to us to see that, uh, you know, because it is a new technology to our customers in many cases, there's oftentimes a little bit of trepidation about how the workers might, might assimilate with, mm -hmm. with the robots. And it's always wonderful to see the positive impacts that we're, that we're having on, on customers' culture. And just, you know, that reflects back to us too. It gives us a real positive impact as we, as we adopt the various expressions that we hear from our customers and, and, plow that back into into innovation within our own products um, yeah. so that we're yeah, working definitely. together um, collaboratively abs absolutely you know um, those experiences what we're seeing on the ground um as you said it's confidence and you know i we we very quickly have worked with with yourselves um you know in the early parts of this year to put a significant new set of investments into you know, to make, to, to move that part of the operation to its next step. So, you know, um, gosh, and if that, that's enabled us to have the capacity, that's enabled us to deal with the growth, that's enabled us to deal with the unknowns. And, you know, what's really exciting, I think, is the, uh, the, the next, the next step. So, you know, I, I've, I keep seeing ideas <laughs> between everybody being discussed about where we take this next. So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's a, definitely a very well, exciting period of time we'll be there with you uh so you know if you think back to those criteria that you put together at the beginning um would you say that would you say that we've together we've been able to to hit those and we're looking absolutely. forward to doing absolutely. more together in the future definitely absolutely i mean you know we're just you're just seeing boots i think really begin to understand what an omni-channel retailer means you know it's probably coincided over the last few months you know, by chance or by you know by, by you know evolution or whatever um w with with the introduction of the locust cobots so um it, you know I, it, it fits in so fundamentally to our our strategy to deal with not just the supply chain anymore it's it's fundamentally the company's um strategy now and yeah, absolutely you know so yeah, absolutely. Lots, lots of well, good stuff to come, I think. <laughs> yep, I think so. Well, we talked about it quite a bit. Let's, let's give our audience a, a little bit of eye candy here. Let's, let's let them see what it looks like on the ground. So uh, let's, let's, let's play some video here. See, uh, give people a look at, at what, what it looks like in operation with 200 robots uh, in this massive facility. Boots is the UK's leading health and beauty retailer. Boots philosophy is a vision of right stop, right place, right time for our customers. Whether that's being delivered to their doorstep or into one of our 2,500 shops. We want to do more and more for our customers, so it's very positive to have new technologies to help us with that. Being an engineer, I just marvel at the box. The Locust bots effectively take away all of the walking from our pickers. Locust's key strength is it allows our pickers to keep picking. I love them because they make my job easier. I'm not pushing anything, I'm not carrying anything. It makes it a lot easier than these big trolleys that they used to have. We've actually had a 77% reduction in accident counts and the new method of picking. It's simpler, it's safer, and colleagues are really excited by them. We operate Locust with around 50 colleagues on each shift, doing around 25,000 customer orders every day. We want to deliver that customer's order as quickly as we can and accurately, so it gets really, really busy. 
we can check on our system performance at any time of day from anywhere in the world and allow us to react to that dynamically, moving workforce where needed and where we might need to move stock to support our pick operation. We've got quite a number of screens up around the warehouse where colleagues can see how we're doing. It becomes a little bit addictive. <laughs> The Locust Solution is a really intuitive and exciting product that has absolutely changed the way boots pick. It's such a, a fantastic solution. I recommend it to anybody, really. The new technology that Boots is investing in is going to help us grow even further in the future. It's really been a pleasure talking with you today, Adam, and, and thank you for, uh, for sharing your time with us today. Uh, I know that you're gearing up for the next peak. I have a question. Do you expect this season is going to look like a traditional peak, or do you think it's going to be more spread out over a longer period of time? What, what do you think it's going to look mm. like this year? One of, one of the, uh, the discussions we have quite a lot, actually, is the... Um, I, th I think we think the shape will be sa the same. So we think, hmm. uh, we still think it'll, um, again, I mentioned Black Friday. Um, I still think that drives sort of a, quite a core behavior. The, what, the bit we're quite interested in though is whether the, the COVID dynamic overlays um, uh, um, customers buying more items per order. So that's the thing we're wrestling with. So we can, typically through the peak period, people just go in and buy their Christmas presents through that period of time. And what we're, what, what we're trying to work out is whether we think people will be buying the, the, you know, the, the, all the other inventory uh, associated with what we saw through the COVID period at the same time. Because that's a really big decision to be made because it can, it can add you know, multiple percentage points of demand very, very quickly. Um, so that's probably the debate. We, we wrestle with a little bit at the moment as we're trying to prepare the, the, the capacity of the operations. Interesting. Well, again, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for being a Locust customer. We love working with you. And um, we'll chat soon. Very good. Thank you very much, Karen. Thank you. And thanks to all of you for joining us today. I really appreciate your joining us here at CSGMP. Well, I hope everybody enjoyed that part of the webinar and I hope you can hear me as well. Um, and we move on to our question and answer section of the webinar now, uh, which is interactive. So please get your questions filling in on the Q&A box down at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and I'm joined live by Karen Levitt, Chief Marketing Officer, Officer at Locus Robotics, who we've just seen on the video. Uh, and she'll be able to field all of your questions. Hello, Karen. Hey, how are you doing, Christopher? Not too well. I've really, changed my shirt. <laughs> I really enjoyed that. That was really fascinating. Um, and you'll Thank be you. delighted to know that we've had lots of questions flooding in um, throughout the webinar itself. So uh, we actually had one come in before we even started this webinar that was emailed into us from uh, uh, Jeffrey Cave Wood. And Jeffrey asked, um, how much effort do you feel is necessary to ensure that maximum safety um, is in is uh, is allowed in the human and robot shared environments. Well, I think uh, actually first let me make a point. The video that was shown there, I'm sure Boots would would want everybody to know that video was shot well before COVID nineteen was was ever a thing. Uh, I'm sure that Boots would want all of the viewers today to know that that all of their associates are wearing uh, proper personal protective equipment in the warehouse, wearing masks, wearing gloves, and practicing social distancing. Uh, so I want to make sure that on Boots' behalf that that's understood. Uh, I think that businesses should do whatever is within their power to protect their employees. The question was interestingly phrased because the question was how much effort is it should be expended. And so I think that one should try and and make sure that employees are protected. And of course, if that can be done with less effort, uh, so much the better. And as Adam and I were discussing, the design point for the Locust Solution 
really didn't anticipate a contagious virus, but the, it does keep the workers separated. So that the workers are only interacting with robots and not with other colleagues. And then of course, I think the question comes up, well, what are we doing to make sure that the robots are protected as their, as their interactions with different colleagues? And uh, to that end, there are several things that take place. One is all of the, the colleagues are wearing protective gears. They're all wearing masks, they're all wearing gloves when they interact with the robots. And then the robot screens, which is the only portion of the robot typically that the associates will, will physically touch, and the robot screens are sanitized uh, for, uh, periodically during the course of the shift. But it's also a very brief interaction between the worker and the robot. The, the worker is reading the screen, and you may, have, you may have noticed in that video that the workers are already pulling items from the shelves as they're approaching the robot because the display screen is so large that they can see the instructions before they get there. So the only contact with the screen they're making really is to tap to confirm the number of items they have and they're doing that with gloved hands. Absolutely. It, it, uh, my next question then, Karen, is from Andy Draycott at um, one of the largest 3PLs here in the UK, Uniparts. And to be honest, I was gonna say you and Andy should get a cup of coffee together, but you can't do that now. So I think you'd have to do a Zoom uh, because he's got lots of questions for you. So I'll just kind okay. of- pick a couple out just so he doesn't maximize time from, from from other people um and he wanted to ask if we could share how much downtime the amrs require for charging and maintenance and how do you go about building capacity into shift patterns for for downtime and maintenance that's a great great question and uh yeah andy by all means let's do a, a virtual cup of coffee but uh so the robots will typically run anywhere from 12 to 14 hours on a single charge. How long is a charge? It's generally somewhere between 30 and 60 minutes. So for if you think about it in round numbers, a robot will work all three shifts on a one hour charge and the robots will take themselves to the charging stations automatically throughout the day. So what they'll do is not only will they go to the charging stations when, when they uh, when the, the amount of the battery drops below a prescribed threshold, but the robots will actually opportunistically take advantage of lulls in the picking time. So even if they were not scheduled to go to the charger, if they see that the order pool has dropped, they'll go to the charger to make sure that they're topped off so that when the, when the order pattern increases again, they're all fully charged. So we generally allocate about one charger for every eight robots or so in the warehouse. Uh, and as part of the design of the concept of operation, when we determine what the number of robots is going to be required to service both the steady state volume as well as peak volumes, we build in the number of chargers and we build in uh, the, ro the number of robots necessary to make sure that all shifts are are fully staffed by by robots as well as humans. Absolutely. Um, what I will say then is uh, I'll get all of Andy's questions over to you as well via email because he's, <laughs> he's got a lot of things to ask. So uh, I, I'm sure you'd appreciate that. Um, I think you touched on this in the video as well, but did you have any uh, cultural challenges in deploying automation and how did you overcome them? So by cultural challenges, uh, you know, so far, so I, I'm going to take the term culture in two different ways. Culture one, sort of a macro cultural level, which is, is there resistance in organizations to bringing in automation, particularly automation that may historically be, be charged with notions of being anti-human? You know, the robot apocalypse is going to take over. Uh, no, generally no. Of course, we were, we were quite sensitive to that particularly several years ago when we were first introducing our robots about four and a half years ago to what the response might be. But we were very quickly disabused of that. The associates and colleagues love using the robots. In fact, we have a whole video on our website of love letters from the um, associates to the robots. The fact is it really makes their jobs easier. We're not we're not eliminating humans. What we're doing is we're doubling the productivity of humans. We're making them superhuman. 
And we're doing it in a way that really makes the job less burdensome for the workers, that they're not pushing carts that weigh 200 pounds. They're not walking 15 miles a day in the warehouse. We've dramatically cut the walking time and they don't have to carry anything. So it makes onboarding much easier. It makes uh, training and, and accuracy levels much, much easier. And the workers get to go home at the end of the day and tell their kids they work with robots. So all of a sudden, mom and dad are cool and, uh, and doing this. And then and one last little coda to the cultural question here. Our robot screens will also automatically detect a worker as the worker approaches and will display instructions in 21 different languages. Wow. So we have some warehouses that have workers with up to a dozen different languages and the worker is always seeing the screens in her preferred language. Absolutely. I've just had a fascinating question come in from Tony Hughes, Karen, who asks, um, Hi, Tony. Did, did you uh, simulate the operation to calculate how many robots you would need and to establish kind of what pick rates would be within the warehouse as well? Yeah, we didn't use a simulator per se. That is, there was, there was no animation that was generated to show the operation. But what we do is we work with every client to go back through their historical volumes to understand their buying patterns as well as the cube of their product, the nature of, their, of the products that are getting picked and the cube of the product. And then we determine what the, um, what the best match of robot configuration is going to be to the site. So one thing that we really emphasize is our solution is configurable, not customizable, which really helps speed the deployment. We're not talking about building it from, you know, as a bespoke solution uh, once, we, once we meet you. But what we do is we look at your orders and we say, all right, you're typically seeing your heaviest picking hours between the hours of, say, 8 a.m. and 1 p.m., and this is the volume that you typically see in that period. This is the cube on the robot. And for that reason, we're going to recommend this type of pick containers, this many robots, this many workers. And we've certainly had customers who have adjusted their shifts, oftentimes consolidating shifts. So some customers who are really uh, groaning under the weight of the volume in their warehouse might start their day very early to make sure that they're, they're catching up. And, and staying on top of their volume during the day. We've had customers who've shortened their hours, start actually a little later in the day, which I know can sound scary to some operators, but our robots are at their most efficient at optimizing the, the, um, the picking operation when they have a, a, a good uh, order pool to pull from. So the, the more liquidity there can be in the orders in the pool, the more selective we can be in matching the orders together. So we'll often tell customers, let the orders pile up for a bit so that we can we have the best opportunity to match and optimize the pick operation. Uh, and to that end, I have a question from Ben Ellins, who asked, what was your approach to integration with um, existing systems at Boots uh, that they had internally within the warehouse environment? And mm -hmm. how, did, how did you approach that? Well, uh, you know, Boots is an interesting warehouse, and you can actually see Boots robots operating behind me. Um, they have uh, an extensive conveyor system, uh, and I don't think it's that I don't think I'm giving away secret news to say that even since this video was shot, they've they've expanded it. Um, so they are very active adopters of technology and they do have other systems in place. You saw their automatic packaging system. They also have an ASRS solution from another vendor. Uh, and so it really is incumbent on us to play nicely with the other technology in the sandbox. Um, and what we're seeing is that, that that's a combination that Boots's, Boots's operations managers can help to guide. They can determine which pool of orders they want to send to the ASRS, which pool they want to send to manual piece picking involving the Locus AMRs. Uh, and really, it's a matter of having everything wind up at common shared resources like the conveyors. You can see the robots behind me are being decanted at 
the conveyor so that the orders can proceed to the automated packaging machines. Um, so we work with all of our customers to determine what these touch points will be. And then it's a fairly straightforward process to do the integration. We use a pretty lightweight set of APIs first to integrate with the WMS, but if then there's any other uh, interaction that needs to take place to make sure that the correct signals are being sent throughout the, the whole PIC life cycle, those are getting communicated in real time every step of the way. Absolutely. Well, Karen, uh, thank you so much for fielding our questions today. I'm sorry we couldn't get through absolutely everybody, but I'll make sure you see them and, uh, and you can get in contact with people if they've not had their question answered today as well. That'd um, be great. So yes, lovely. Thank you so much for your time this afternoon. Uh, I'm afraid this webinar is coming to an end. So I'll just remind people that uh, it is available on demand on logisticsmanager.com. So please uh, share with your colleagues, uh, with other people in your organization uh, and look out for an email telling you when that's up on our website. Um, and I would also like to thank our two speakers today. So that's Adam Coventry, uh, who we heard from earlier, who's head of warehousing for boots.com uh, at Boots UK. And of course to Karen, who's still with me now, uh, Chief Marketing Officer at Locus Robotics. So thank you for your time and expertise. Uh, just like to remind our audience that we have a few things coming up. Uh, the next Intra Logistics Connected webinar takes place at 10.30 a.m. on Tuesday the 3rd of November. That's next week, everybody, uh, which is titled Automated Fulfillment Within Artificial Intelligence but Without Disruption. Uh, and that's in association with Adlink, who will join us to discuss machine vision artificial intelligence at work within fulfillment centers uh, so make sure you look out for a registration email or go onto the website now logisticsmanager.com to register for that um, and as i said finally uh, there's uh, the uh, on-demand recording of this webinar will be available on logisticsmanager.com most likely from tomorrow after tomorrow morning and that's it thank you again for attending this webinar thank you to our speakers and to our sponsors locus robotics and we look forward to seeing you all soon thank you thank you all thank you